So today we're going to analyze one of the simplest oscillators, and that's the ring oscillator. So essentially, the ring oscillator is, in its most general form, uh, a set of three inverting amplifiers. And each of the amplifiers have a gain of minus A, which is in general a function of omega. So these are three inverting amplifiers. And the reason that we want to make them inverting is because at DC, we're going to assume that the gain minus A at, of omega is just some constant, minus A0. And so at DC, if we have some input, so some noise that gets into the circuit uh, that increases this node's voltages, the negative amplifier is going to decrease this node's voltage, increase, decrease. Uh, and since this is shorted to our original amplifier, it's going to decrease the uh, noise voltage. So essentially, we've got a negative feedback amplifier at DC. So this amplifier isn't unstable um, at DC frequencies, which is nice uh, because we don't want the output to just be all high or all low. We want it to oscillate at some frequency. So we need to make sure that the negative feedback becomes positive feedback at only one specific frequency, omega. So how do we do that? Uh, well, if we want to actually implement our ring oscillator, uh, the simplest circuit to do that with is just three common source amplifiers. So we've got one common source, and we say that uh, it's got a dominant pole formed with its load capacitance. We've got a second common source which also has a dominant pole formed with its load capacitances. And so we're neglecting all of the parasitic capacitances in the circuit. And we've got a third inverting amplifier, which also has a dominant pole formed by the load capacitance. And so if we want three amplifiers uh, in a row, we just connect them like this. And we've got our output voltage and our input voltage. And we just connect this output all the way back to the input, and we've formed our three inverting amplifiers. So what's the overall transfer function of this system? Well, the, the easiest way to find it is just to recognize that since these stages are isolated from each other, uh, because the gate input resistance of a MOSFET gate is infinity, then we can say the transfer function of an individual stage, let's just say HI, uh, is equal to its DC gain, A0, which is in general GMRD in parallel with the output resistance, but I'm going to call it A0 just for ease of writing things, divided by 1 plus J omega uh, multiplied by the dominant pole, or divided by the dominant pole, so RDCL. Uh, and since we've got three of these stages cascaded together, we're going to assume that the drain resistances and the load capacitances are all equal, which is not terribly unreasonable. So we're just going to cube this transfer function. So that's our total transfer function. But that's without feedback. So that's assuming that we, we break this wire. So with feedback, uh, we can just treat this as a simple traditional system. So we've got some input voltage Vn, and we're applying negative feedback with feedback factor of 1. Uh, and we know that the overall closed loop transfer function of that is just A over 1 plus A. So our closed loop transfer function is just this term, H total, H total over 1 plus H total. Uh, and that's just A0 over 1 plus J omega RDCL, all cubed. OK, so how do we get the circuit to oscillate? Well, we know that when HT is equal to minus 1, our circuit will oscillate. The transfer function will blow up to infinity at a positive real frequency, and our circuit will oscillate. So we need to set HT equal to minus 1. That means A0 over 1 plus J omega RDCL must equal cubed, must equal minus 1. 
And the easiest way to do this is by setting the magnitude and phase independently to minus, independently to minus one. So we say that the phase of this function h must equal minus 180 degrees, and the magnitude of h must equal one. And so we're going to do the phase condition first, because it turns out that will make our lives uh, a lot easier. So the phase of this function is just the phase of a naught, which is a constant, so that's zero, uh, minus the phase of one plus j omega rd cl. But we've got three of these uh, j omega rd cls. We've got th uh, three of these poles, so we need to multiply by three. Um, okay, so what is the phase of that? Well, it's just the inverse tangent of the imaginary part divided by the real part, since we're always going to be in the first quadrant. So that's minus three times inverse tangent of imaginary part is j omega rdcl, or omega rdcl, the real part's one, so omega rdcl. And that should be equal to minus 180 degrees. And you might say, well, why didn't you say plus 180 degrees? So we could have done that, and we'd get the, uh, we'd get a uh, result that doesn't actually make sense, um, physical sense at least. So we see that the tangent inverse of omega RDCL must equal 60 degrees, or minus 180 divided by minus three, or omega RDCL must equal the tangent of 60 degrees, which is just square root of three. So omega should be one over RDCL times the square root of three. Okay, so it turns out that the phase condition independently uh, determines what frequency we will oscillate at. Uh, and that's cool because it lets us uh, easily solve the rest of this problem. So we, we just completed the phase condition. Now we need to complete the magnitude condition. So we need to say the magnitude of HT, which is just the magnitude of A naught cubed divided by the magnitude of one plus J omega RDCL cubed, uh, that must equal one. And we don't, uh, we don't know what A naught needs to be in order for this to happen, but that's what we're trying to find here. So we know what frequency we're going to oscillate at, but we don't know what A naught will allow for oscillation. So that's what we're actually trying to solve for here. Uh, so we can say, a naught cubed must equal one plus j omega rd cl magnitude cubed, and we can just get rid of the cubes. And magnitude of a naught is just a naught, so a naught is just equal to the magnitude of one plus j omega rd cl. But we know from before what omega has to be in order for the circuit to oscillate, so we can just plug that in there, and we see that a naught must equal the magnitude of one plus j times one over rdcl times rdcl square root of three. And these guys cancel, and we're left with the magnitude of one plus j square root of three, which if we take the square root, that's just the square root of one plus square root of three squared, which is three, square root of four, which is two. So that's interesting. Uh, in order for this ring oscillator circuit to oscillate, we need a gain of 2 and a frequency of root 3 over RDCL. So if we go back to our original circuit, uh, no matter what RDCL is, the circuit's going to oscillate at a certain frequency. That's another interesting thing. Uh, and the frequency of oscillation is root 3 over RDCL. So it's almost like RDCL, uh, either they don't even matter so much uh, in terms of whether or not the circuit will oscillate, but they allow us to tune uh, the frequency of oscillation. And we know that the DC gain must be two. And the DC gain of a common source amplifier is just GM RD. So that must equal two. So our gain condition effects effectively fixes RD and then we can choose the load capacitance to tune the frequency, and that determines uh, where the circuit, how the circuit will oscillate. But there's something a little strange about this picture. It's according to this, our gain must be exactly two for the circuit to oscillate. 
And we know that practically speaking, we're not able to make a circuit with a gain of exactly two. It's going to be slightly less or slightly more. So by this analysis, we should be completely unable to make uh, oscillators in the real world. But fortunately, we're missing something about this whole picture. And I'm going to go over that in the next video. And that lets us make oscillators in the real world.